give me that sunny side. Keep my hand, just give me that sunny side. One more time. Keep my hand, just give me that sunny side. Thank you, Ted. So we would like to thank you all for coming to this production. Um, you will note that there are no laughter or applause signs, which we wish there were. So when there's dead space, that's what you're supposed to do, either laugh or applaud. Okay. Um, we are happy tonight to bring you some very special guests. Tonight we've got David and Nicholas Oft um, of Oft's Flock Feather Farm. Woo! Probably the most popular boys in Green Lake. We also have Tom and Wendy Schultz of the Green Lake Bird and Nature Club. Thank you to Tom and Wendy for coming. Dr. Joe Fredrickson of the Weiss Museum. I, I did it, okay. Larry Bellin of the Dartford Historical Society. And Carol Skivington of Free Spirit Yoga. Woo! So without any further ado, here's Franny. <laughs> Hi, Annie. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Ted, Otto. How are you doing? Fred? I'm good. How are you? You look fantastic. Oh, you. Say that to all the girls. So, Jen. So, Fran. I've seen you in some interesting outfits before. You have? But I have to say, this is by far the most glamorous. What are you talking about? Well, uh, you're looking very aviarian. Is that a word? What? <laughs> Seriously? What do you mean? Well, I don't know, but uh, let's just say the eagle has landed. <laughs> like, uh, all over you. So when I w walked out of my house today, we live on kind of a big bluff, and it was so windy. And I did one of my bird calls because I knew that Tom and Wendy were going to be here. And all of a sudden, all this huge swarm of, I don't even know, like all these, I thought I had them all out. You should have seen how many I picked off of me. Yeah. Well, you look like the modern day Tippy Hedron. Yeah. 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 Or it's Tipsy Hedron, maybe. Tipsy Hedron. Yeah. Get this girl another drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's nice. But my, my, you know, they don't look quite as scary as the birds. Well, yeah, the birds. they're not as bad. They yeah. were bad when they were all like coming at me Friendly. and like, pecking oh. at my face. Like that was horrible. Well, we have a lot of birds on our program tonight. We do. I'm super excited. I am too. Although I have to admit, I am scared to death of birds. I don't really like them either. Truth be told. <laughs> so anyway, this is going to be a little challenge for yeah. us both. They're better than snakes. Oh, I have to say yes. Because they can fly away. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. All right. Well, well shall we get on with the show? Let's do it. Okay. Our first guests tonight are David and Nicholas Oft. <laughs> oh, my. Here it cluck, everywhere it cluck, cluck. Okay, uh, David and Nicholas are entrepreneurs. They run a farm by uh, themselves with the help of their uh, social media expert mother uh, and grow vegetables and, and dad. Uh, chickens. And so uh, tell us, tell everybody who is who. Who's David and who's Nicholas? Um, I'm David. And I'm Nicholas. Okay. And I see you've brought some uh, chickens with you that have been working on making Easter eggs. Is that correct? These ones may or do not make Easter eggs, but we do have a few that do. And I hope you're not too scared of them. What's, what's the difference between a chicken that makes an Easter egg and the one that doesn't? They're earlobes. Their earlobes will tell the color of the egg. And so what happens if you've got a white earlobe? White eggs. Green earlobe. Green eggs. Brown earlobe. Brown eggs. What other color earlobes are there? Uh, there's a kind of a creamy color. Um, don't really know many others. 
Um, there's an olive colored egg. Tell us, tell us the names of your chickens here. Uh, we have Opal in my arm. Ooh. Little Mama and Queen. Little Mama and Queen. Little Mama is the speckled one here, and then Queen is the one with the crown. So they're all, all different kinds of chickens. Can you tell us what kind of chickens they are? Yes, this is a Cochin, I believe a gray one. Little Mama is a Millie Fleur. And then Queen is a black laced Polish. Well, she's got the nicest hairstyle, I have to say. Hey, Fran, grab, yes. grab three of those eggs and I'll teach you how to juggle. I want to do that. I want to see that right Check now. Check out these eggs. They make their own Easter eggs. I love it. Yeah. You don't even we need to color. We have one more dozen for sale. Uh, first come, first serve. I told you they were entrepreneurs. Right? So I, I want to ask these boys a question, if that's okay, Fran. Absolutely. Go ahead. So I am pretty sure I saw, maybe I dreamt this, but I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I saw a picture of you two in the Green Lake Reporter maybe last year that said you were going to buy Town Square someday. Okay, that was, um, you can ask our mother about that. It was an April Fool's joke. I think you guys should buy it. I think it would be amazing. Yeah, no. She's I, afraid you're going to wreck her hair, I don't. I don't think we could, uh, could afford it, and even if we could, why would we buy this town hall? It's like a community center. Well, that's right. true. You can just right. come here and hang out. Yep. We'll be doing that every Friday this summer. I, I, yeah, I, I understand you're going to be at uh, the farm market this summer. It starts on Fridays on May 13th. Tell us what you're going to have there. Well, starting out, we're going to be having asparagus and rhubarb. And then as the season continues, we're going to be getting more of a selection, cucumbers, zucchini, um, I believe maybe eggplants, potatoes, carrots, all sorts of stuff. And will you have these Easter eggs there too? Most likely. Easter eggs all year round? Yep. Do, yes. Do, do, chickens, how, do chickens lay eggs all year round? Yep. There's not like an egg season or anything. Um, you usually get your more eggs during the summer when it's more hot and they're enjoying more sunlight, but they lay eggs year round no matter what. Cool. All right. So, um, tell us how you, um, what your day looks like every day. You get up early in the morning and do all sorts of work before you go to school? Um, well, you, uh, the last couple of years we've been waking up 6.30, doing our chicken chores, then getting ready for school hopping on the bus, going to school, coming back home, doing chores, and then any other chores we have around. And now lately, um, starting uh, early, uh, m more late March, we just got some. Somebody's not happy. <laughs> There's your bok bok. <laughs> Anyway, we just got some market lambs, so we've been waking up earlier to feed those and top off their waters. Otherwise, it's a pretty normal day. Um, otherwise, it's a pretty normal day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of turning to a normal day, waking up earlier and feeding these sheep. Yeah. And do, do you get to eat, even eat breakfast in there somewhere? Usually, I have a bagel. He has a breakfast burrito made by, made by our grandma. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right, David and Nicholas, so you'll be at our uh, Friday Farm Market. We are really looking forward to seeing you there. Yep, and then after the fair, possibly we might be selling a bit of lamb. Ooh. And so are, are you going to be uh, farmers when you grow up? I want to. Nic you already are. What am I talking about? Yeah, Nicholas wants to be a fisherman. I don't what. One, one, one last question. Tell us about, I, I understand you're pumpkin growers. Yes. Um, Nicholas has been a member for two years. I just started this year. Well, this is his second and year. And what, what's this group called? Giant, Wisconsin Giant Pumpkin Growers, I believe. Um, just early March, they had this seminar where they had a few guest speakers, like tonight we'll be having a few. Um, basically sh explaining their growing year and sometimes tips and tricks on how to grow huge pumpkins. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Tell us about the biggest pumpkin you ever grew. Our biggest pumpkin we ever grew is, was 586 and a half pounds. And was that an award winner? That must have been an award winner. No. No. Come on. Big, the biggest pump. Yeah, they get to the 2,000 pounds, even over that. Holy Moses. I, I'd rather have your 500-something pound pumpkin than the 2,001 any day. You know, you can only cook so many pies, right? Yeah. No, you can't. a lot of pumpkin. <laughs> I want to see no. it. I definitely no. want to no. see it. Well, you know, no. I, no. honestly, I, I, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a pass on that. Uh, well, because of the um, bird flu, um, Brenda, Nicholas, and David's uh, mother has asked that we not actually handle the chickens. It's not, you can't pass it to humans, but it's just not a good idea to handle the chickens. And there's also the fact that you don't like birds. <laughs> According to your I, bird I, story. I, I like birds. I'm afraid of them. You know, I, I like Frankenstein, but, you know, I'm afraid of them. I don't think Frankenstein's a bird. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're going to be talking about some dinosaur birds lately. I think those are worthy being afraid of. So, so anyway. then you're afraid of these guys then? I, I am. I am. Because, you know, someday in the future, they'll be talking, they'll be bringing the bones of these guys around. So. Um, yeah, um, fun fact, these guys are actually related to the Tyrannosaurus Rex. They are not. Uh, yeah, they're very decent de uh, des descendant. descendant relatives. How did you find that out? Did you go on bird genealogy? Research. Research. Excellent. I mean, that's why Google's here today. Oh. Bird Google. Well, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for being here. No problem. That was David and Nicholas Oft, and this is the Green Lake Show. Our next guests today are more bird people, Tom and Wendy Schultz of the Green Lake Bird and Nature Club. Nice to see you. Hi, Wendy. Hi, <laughs> Thanks for coming by. All right, well, uh, Tom and Wendy are known as the bird people of Green Lake and uh, way far beyond. And are the uh, town square has been the home of the Green Lake Bird and Nature Club pretty much since we started here. Um, and we have the Bird Fest coming up, our uh, big bird festival with your uh, club, oh, with, with including an official poster. That's right. Available for your personal viewing during the break. Uh, it's April 29th and 30th. That's correct. Tell us, uh, I don't think your mic is on, Tom. Oh, well, th these guys want to come to the Bird and Nature Club and the festival. Yes, you have to turn it on. All right, I think it's working now. Is that on? So uh, t on? tell us, Here. tell us how you uh, first got interested in uh, birds and how you first got into this whole thing. And I think you two met through some birdish. Some type bird thing. club, yeah. We yes. met in a bird club in Fond du Lac. But my my interest in birds started when I was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin, down Madison. My hall advisor was a bird watcher, and I started assisting him going out on taking kids out on field trips. And I birded a lot of my own, and I started drawing and painting in my spare time in college. And after I graduated, I decided to pursue bird art as a career. So it's not, not, not your usual. What did, what did your parents think of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they were willing to uh, put up with me for a while. I moved back home for a couple years and uh, set up a studio and started working. Uh, I got a, uh, a painting of mine accepted into the juried Birds and Art Show up in Wausau, Wisconsin. It was a, the biggest bird show in the whole world, bird art. 
And it just so happened that same year, this was 1981, the National Geographic Society was looking for bird artists so they could put together a field guide. So I was one of 13 artists that were invited to work on the National Geographic Field Guide. And that I worked is. with them for many years on contract. This is the seventh edition, so it, it meant, went through a number of changes over the years. Wow, that is, that is so impressive. So now, were you still living with your parents when this whole thing happened? I was. And what did they have to say about that then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, day, the day the uh, Smithsonian shipped over a huge steel crate uh, cabinet, I should say, for storing specimens. I was working on gulls, and th these guys are huge, like the size of a goose, some of them, but they wanted a storage cabinet, so they were protected. And uh, we had a, they, they both brought a big moving truck to haul this huge file cabinet over wow. there, and I stored them there. And so, so tell me uh, about how you and Wendy met, <laughs> or maybe Wendy should tell that story. Well, I was an art major for one year at, in, at uh, Oshkosh, at, at, at the I don't college. think your mic is on. How about that? Oh, yeah. There. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to be a, an, an artist my whole life, and I went to school for one year at Oshkosh as an art major. And then the following summer, my mother said, you're not coming home. I'm you're, you got a job in Fond du Lac at this nursing home, and I got you an apartment, and I've got four other children at home, and you're not coming home. So I b was a nursing assistant at a nursing home, and I changed my major because I really loved it. And I went to Marion College. So at Marion College, my microbiology teacher said, hey, I know, you're, I know you like art, and there's this guy in our bird club that's... I think you should show him some of your artwork. <laughs> see, come up and see my essay. Show him some of your yeah. artwork? Is, so, that, is that what they're calling it these days? <laughs> right. This is, try to remember, this is a family program. This is a friend's home. So this was in 1981, and he invited me to this bird club meeting, the Owen J. Grummy Bird Club, um, that met at Marion College. And I thought, oh my God, Mary Jane Hathaway and all of... <laughs> <laughs> strange bird watchers, but I went and um, I met Tom there. <laughs> so that's how we met. But I was very interested in, um, I mean, I was fascinated with the idea that there were all these birds out there that I had never paid attention to in my whole entire life. So that's how we met. And tell, tell us uh, about the uh, Green Lake Bird and Nature Club. You guys are doing really cool things all the time. I know that. Uh, you meet, uh, how often do you meet? We meet monthly from mm -hmm. September through May. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to Town Square. They provided us with a meeting room. Although during COVID, we've been meeting up here in the ballroom because we have more space to spread out, mm -hmm. socially distanced. But uh, we, we've been meeting, uh, I guess we started in 2015. So right, right. About, and you've got a real... Uh, active uh, Facebook page, I know. A lot of birders posting uh, pictures on your Facebook we page. We have like 600, I don't know, 625 members on Facebook. And so do you have to, it's a Facebook page where you have to come on there and like ask to join it or something? It's very exclusive. Yeah, and like Wendy's the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper. <laughs> how, do, how do you tell if you don't want somebody on well, there? I, I kind of, I mean, I look, I make sure it's not something strange Cause, because because you know, there are, are um, people that are... Yes. <laughs> Wendy, would I be able to get in? <laughs> I think you look like you fit the part. All right, <laughs> amazing. So you're not that I, exclusive. I, I, don't, no, don't do it. Generally... Don't, don't let her on. I, I really, we try to keep it local, or, or I mean within a reasonable distance, because when we first started the Facebook page, we didn't want anybody to feel intimidated by asking Questions that are relatively beginner questions. I, I didn't want it. We didn't want anybody to feel like they couldn't do that. But um, honestly, it's amazing how many people we have. Pe friends have friends that we know, and mm -hmm. um, it's been just wonderful. 
Wow, yeah, I know it's really active. I get notified when you uh, have posts. And so, uh, you know, that's most of my email messages now. There's a posting in the Bird and Nature Club. <laughs> we, we have actually kind of a unique group because we don't actually have a true membership. Mm -hmm. We don't collect dues. So, so we have our Facebook group. Most of those people, people we don't see coming to our meetings. And then besides that, we have an email group. And we send out, I don't know, 300 some emails to notify people about meetings and field trips and things like that. And people can just drop into your meetings. Anybody's meetings. welcome. Yeah. 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 And I know now you've got your uh, books, all sorts of uh, books down in our new uh, club room, formerly known as Studio B. Can people just drop in and learn about We have about a library there, there yeah. and people are, willing, are able to loan them or borrow them. Mm -hmm. We loan them out uh, as needed. We're, we're trying to downsize a little bit because uh -huh. <laughs> Uh -huh. We've well, got duplicates of some books, that's for sure. So tell us about the uh, Bird Fest coming up. What's going to be going on? Well, we have, have it on two dates. Uh, it starts on Friday night, night the 29th. And for that, that's really a social gathering. It'll take place in this room. And we'll have uh, raffle prizes available for purchase or for bidding on, I should say. We'll do a, a slide presentation. Uh, quiz show, I guess you could call it, fun stuff, yeah. And then Saturday morning, the next morning, we'll have a field trip at Sunnyside Conservancy from six till eight, eight six, o'clock. Six, you, you, you hear that, David and Nicholas? That's right <laughs> in your timetable, 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> they got their own birds to take care of. <laughs> well, if, if you have it at 6 a.m., it kind of keeps out the riffraff. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> right here. Yeah. <laughs> so then uh, right after the field trip we'll come back here up to this room and we'll have a few presentations that take place through the, the morning and then at, at the end of the presentations we're going to gather and have a second field trip then over to White River Marsh. What kind of presentations will there be? Well I'll be doing a, a talk about uh, Green Lake being a bird city which I, which I could talk a little bit more about that's actually the reason that we started a, a bird festival here because that's one of the requirements when you're a bird city to to host some sort of a celebration and that's we actually started that the year before we came became a bird club and um, it attracts a lot of people we get probably a couple hundred people showing up for the bird festival cool, cool. last Two years ago, we had to cancel everything because of the pandemic. Last year, we stayed on the safe side and we had a festival, but it was all field trips. We had four different field trips, all outdoors. But this year, we're kind of breaking in gradually and having some, some outdoor, some indoor. Our, uh, our, sec our, our main presentation this year will be on snowy owls. And it'll be about a particular snowy owl by the name of Fond du Lac that was trapped. And they put a transmitter on it. And that way they can track the movements of the bird. And it travels up to the Arctic, travels around up there, comes back to the area. And once they come back within the cell phone tower uh, range, all of the data from that from the travels of that owl, get, do they, do get they, downloaded. Do they call you, tell you when you're done. <laughs> they could do that, yeah. But but that it's really fascinating. So they're going to be talking about that. A couple of guys from the Horicon Marsh Club. Now, now you, uh, Tom's art is uh, being displayed in our lobby right now. He is our artist of the month, and uh, so uh, please uh, make sure you take a look at that uh, this evening. And don't you have a, a snowy owl down there? Is it, did I see well, a snowy owl? Well, I or? did, but I sold it. And, uh, and the guy who purchased it took it along with him, so I put another picture up there in oh, its place. Oh, no, that was the one, one I was mesmerized by that. <laughs> was uh, was that? No, I was following it. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I have a, I have a question for you. So when our birds fly south for the winter time, you know, and there's already birds in the south. Doesn't it get awfully crowded down there? Uh, that's, that's probably true, but you know, 
what happens here in the winter time, it gets cold. There are no bugs anywhere to be to be found and eaten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so they go to, to warmer climates and Sorry, I'm sure like it, the Florida birds, like here comes the snow birds. <laughs> Uh, pretty much the same. They're all complaining it's, down uh, there. It's an annual migration. It's a problem. <laughs> just, it's a problem. Just, so. <laughs> then the price of nests has gone through the roof. <laughs> That's for sure. So, Well, Tom and Wendy, it's been delightful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks for making Town Square your home for the Bird Club. It's always, it's always fun, those crazy birders. Anybody that's interested in joining us, we meet the second Tuesday of the month, 6 p.m., upstairs here from September through May, although we also sometimes um, hold a spontaneous, fun little something, maybe movie night in the summertime, but really it's from September through May, and really we have just, uh, it's really fun. It's a nice group of people that meet. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, the bird, the birders are nice. Yeah. You the told birders me that. are the nicest people on the world. You the, call them the birders? The birders. The birders. Not the Berbers. Birders. <laughs> Berbers. I thought, Berbers. I thought you carpet. made that up. Birder. So it rhymes with yeah. murders. Like, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> birders. All right, well, thank you for being here. That's uh, Tom and Wendy Schultz, and this is the Green Lake Show. Our next guest is Dr. Joe Fredrickson from the Weiss Museum, and he is here tonight. Okay. Hi, Joe. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. Dr. Fredrickson is a dinosaur expert. Ooh. And so and you're a doctor. So are you like a dinosaur doctor? I think you failed miserably because they're all dead. That, that, not all of them. We had a couple on stage already. Well, birds. that's true. Birds, but birds can, are dinosaurs? If, the, if anything happens to those birds, I can't help them. <laughs> that's, that's not my job. <laughs> Pardon me. So uh, what, what, how do you become a doctor of dinosaurs? What's your, what's your doctorate? So my doctorate is in zoology with a master's in uh, geology. So you can either study the rocks or you can study the animals because in the end you're studying animal-shaped rocks, which is what I do. That is so cool. Well, we have a really cool event coming up uh, on the 11th of June called Dino Days. And it is a great kids event here at uh, Town Square. We did it for the first time last year. Uh, 100 people signed up, 600 people showed up, and uh, so we thought we'd up the ante this year. We had to bring in the big guns, so that's why we've got Dr. Fredrickson with us. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing at Dino Days. So we have a lot planned. We're going to actually bring in multiple tables worth of fossils, so we're going to have actual dinosaurs here, uh, some dinosaur skeletons, some replicas and casts. Uh, and then we're also going to be giving lectures. I think there's a certain movie that's going to be coming out uh, a week before, uh, maybe a Jurassic World, Ooh. that uh, so we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, and we're going to also gonna bring in our new augmented reality sandbox that actually has a dinosaur mode in it. So a lot of really neat stuff uh, to, to talk about. And so is this uh, fun for just not just kids but adults as well? Do you not like dinosaurs? I, I've never really met one personally other than those chickens. Well, yeah. It, no, it'll be a lot of fun for just about everyone. Um, I mean, basically, if you can walk all the way till you can't walk anymore, you're going to have a good time here. And you're probably going to learn a thing or two because we're going to have lectures talking about uh, what's wrong with Jurassic Park and what's right with Jurassic Park. We're going to have a lecture about the local geology, and we might even have a guest lecture talking about the, everyone's favorite dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Is that everyone's favorite? I that's like the one that's favorite. like on the Flintstones. What's that one? Dino? Dino. Dino? Yeah. What yeah. kind of a dinosaur is that? Uh, He's a D-Rex. D-Rex, I like that, yeah. Dino. Dino? Dino Rex. D-Rex? D-Rex. Dino Rex. Fran. I thought he had yeah, a friendly a D -Rex. Rex. No. No. It was a cartoon. But Rex sounds like <laughs> to me, you know. He did yeah. the <laughs> He did that. Yeah. yeah. Dino yeah. did that. Yeah. He was okay. a baby. He was a baby? He was a baby, yeah. He'll get bigger and eat the rest of the Flintstones later. Well, what, a, what did I know? 
Uh, so uh, we've brought along some interesting things with you here. And I'm hoping, ooh, Don't drop it's it. really heavy. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. So I brought uh, a little heck taste is it? of just some of the dinosaurs that we can see at Dino Days. And uh, this one right here is a replica of a really neat dinosaur called Camarasaurus. It lived about 150 it's million years. Did it drive a Camaro? It's Camaro, a Camarasaurus? Yeah, that's probably why. Um, it's a long-necked dinosaur, so this animal would have been 30 or 40 feet long, so if it was standing here, it would fill up most of this room. Uh, and the really cool thing about these dinosaurs that we just learned last year was that when we find them, we normally find rocks in their stomach, these polished stones. And for those of you familiar with chickens, you probably have seen them eating grit before, and they do this for a specific reason. It actually helps them digest plant material. Well, guess what? Dinosaurs did that too. Now, these dinosaurs are actually from Wyoming. They're from Montana. They're from Utah. They're not from Wisconsin, the, for the best of our knowledge, because we don't have any dinosaurs here in Wisconsin. Uh, about 12,000 years ago, the glaciers came through and wiped all of those rocks that would have had dinosaurs in them clean and pushed them down to Chicago. Another reason to hate Chicago. Stole our dinosaurs, right? <laughs> so, but what we do find when we look at these rocks, these polished stones are actually from... Baraboo, Wisconsin. They're part of the Baraboo Quartzite. They're some of the hardest rocks in the world, which means 150 million years ago, these dinosaurs would actually have to walk across the United States to come get our awesome Wisconsin rocks. So even though there's no dinosaurs in Wisconsin, there's a little bit of di uh, Wisconsin in dinosaurs. We have the most delicious rocks. We sure do. Wisconsin rocks. Yeah, Wisconsin rocks. There you have it. There we go. All right, what else have we got right, here? This is another yep. big, uh, scary-looking thing with teeth. That's exactly what they were doing. So that is a jaw from an Allosaurus, a cousin of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It also lived at the same time of Camarasaurus, so it probably ate them. Um, this is a full-grown individual, <laughs> and this is another uh, fossil from Utah. So I like to bring these out here because you can actually see the uh, skull in two different ways. You're looking at the inside of the skull on this side, flip it around. That is the outside of the skull. Uh, one of the cool things is that this cast actually shows little dots above the teeth. Those are where the nerve endings would come in. So uh, dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex had kind of small arms for their body size, not as big as uh, living birds today. So they didn't use their hands for grabbing things as much or feeling around. They actually had to use their faces. So if this animal was standing right here, before it would eat you, it would actually nuzzle you quite a bit. So you'd think it was just being sweet, and then it would bite you in half. Uh, if I, I saw, had a cat like that If I that saw once. this, I would, I would not be mistaken that it was looking <laughs> sweet. Want to hold that? I do. Okay, so what you're holding probably one of the more famous dinosaur skulls. This is the holotype, or named specimen, of Velociraptor. He's so little. He's so little, exactly. So Velociraptor was actually not that much bigger than a turkey in real life. Like the real kick-me dinosaur. It wouldn't be that scary. Uh, Jurassic Park actually was using a different dinosaur for its model for Velociraptor. That was a dinosaur called Deinonychus, and this is a claw from that type of raptor. Um, and those are found in North America. Velociraptor is actually found in Mongolia. So when we're talking about Velociraptor from the movie Dressburg, we're actually talking about Deinonychus and not the uh, Velociraptor because it wouldn't have been all that scary. Whoa. All right. The this one's not scary? I don't think it's that scary. I mean, I could fight it. I probably wouldn't win, but... That one is That scary. one is, yeah. yeah. Uh, Velociraptor claw would have been about that big. Okay, so the last thing I'm bringing is I did promise that we'll have some real fossils here. So these are all exact replicas of specimens that are at other museums. But the Weiser Science Museum, which is in Menasha, open Wednesday through Saturday if you want to come visit, we do have quite a bit of real fossil material. And I'm actually holding a real dinosaur tooth here that was discovered by my wife who's sitting at the middle of the room right there. So this is from Montana. This is the actual tooth? It's an actual tooth from a Tyrannosaur <gasps> called Albertosaurus. So to put that in perspective, it would have been about the same size as this Allosaurus here, but it lived in the late Cretaceous. Now, you'll notice that it's a little bit broken apart. You can see that it's not quite as pristine condition. This is why we don't bring real fossils all the time, because it requires a lot of glue to put them back together. But That's so cool. And then this one right here. And the cool thing about it is you can actually feel on the edges that those teeth are serrated, which means that they have little tiny denticles on them that help them cut through their food. 
So it would have been just like a steak knife. So this thing we know was an absolute predator. So uh, what, what dinosaur didn't get eaten by everybody else? That's a good question. Seems like all they did was eat one another. Yeah, I mean, you, and then you get old enough, you're going to get eaten by a younger version of the same thing. So even Tyrannosaurus Rex, they the ate one, their own. They were kind? Canna they were cannibalistic. Um, mm. Almost all dinosaurs that we have, uh, at least one representative with bite marks in it, probably from whatever the largest predator was. So T. Rex, there's quite a few of them that actually have bite marks on them from uh, being eaten or at least uh, fighting with another Tyrannosaur. No. It was a dinosaur eat dinosaur world back then. No, I like it. <laughs> oh wow. Um so I'm all out of fossils. That's all I brought. She, Come back on June eleventh for the all, <laughs> He's all out of fossils. How did you first get interested in this dinosaurs? Uh Jurassic Park. Uh, I was uh, uh, four years old when that movie came out. So that dates me, so you know how old I am now. Wait, you saw that movie when you were four? I did. My, I had terrible parents. Um, they allowed me to go, no. Actually, no. your parents are making fe me feel like I'm no. an okay parent. So <laughs> I, I went to go see uh, yeah, Jurassic Park when I was four, and it just I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I thought the fact that they showed dinosaurs as living, breathing animals, and they made them actually look so bird-like. And that's because uh, we know now, and at the time it was just becoming uh, known to science, was that birds are actually dinosaurs. Um, they actually come See, from the raptor line of dinosaurs. this is why I'm afraid of them. They have a lot of the same traits. Those three toes on their feet with the big claws on the end, dinosaurs had the same thing. Hollow bones, most of the dinosaurs, especially the theropod dinosaurs, the meat-eating ones, had hollow bones as well. And feathers, even Velociraptor, would have been fully feathered, basically from the, you know somewhere on its snout all the way down to probably halfway down its foot, and then it would have had scaly feet, kind of just like an ostrich. See, sometimes you just gotta trust the gut. Being afraid of birds, <laughs> I was right. So, do do we have time to? Can I ask a question? Yeah, like a serious fine. question. Yeah. Yeah. You just said birds and dinosaurs have hollow bones. They do. Can you talk about like what? Why? What? How? So bones are really heavy, and if you want to fly you need to get rid of some weight. And one of the easiest ways to do that is actually to get rid of some of your bones. Now, you don't want to get the outside of the bone, so you get rid of the inside, and they actually have struts on the inside that keep them so the bones aren't actually any um, less strong, but they're quite a bit lighter, and that allows that uh, these living birds to fly. Now, dinosaurs um, actually had those before they could even fly, and the reason for that was they also have air sacs all over their, uh, their bones. So these air sacs probably go into their bones, and take up some of that room. Uh, why they have that is probably due to their advanced metabolism. Uh, birds are amazing. They're so much better than we are at a lot of things. And uh, I wish I had, uh, I had air sacs. You could breathe a lot better without uh, gasping for breath every uh, when you're going for a run. So. so yeah, dinosaurs are awesome. Well, they're better at flying. I know that much. <laughs> well, Dr. Fredrickson, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me, and I hope to see you all on June 11th. That was Dr. Joe Fredrickson, and this is the Green Lake Show. Our next guest is Larry Balin of the Dartford Historical Society. Hi, Larry. Oh. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. It's so great to be back in this building. Yeah, Larry's going to talk to us about some more recent history. Things that we thought was, were ancient history until the last uh, conversation. That's right. You know a lot about <laughs> this building. Uh, Larry's been with the Historical Society how long now? Ooh, 49 years. 49 short years. So you, you've seen a lot of what's going, gone on in Green Lake in person, and you know about what came before you. Is that correct? Spent, spent a little time looking at some of the materials, uh, photographs and letters. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. We had a real interesting letter from Eliza Dart, which oh. was Anson Dart's wife. Cool. Uh, about back to her family for the first winter that they survived in the Green Lake area. Cool. So, 
cool. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this year is Green Lake's 175th anniversary. So we're really uh, looking back and looking uh, forward. We're always looking forward at this community center. It's our 10th anniversary here this year, saving this uh, old uh, historic courthouse. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. So it's part of Green Lake's history that we really didn't want to see go away and wanted to be able to make it available to everybody in our community. Uh, we're doing a, a 5K walk on the May 28th uh, around the uh, city. And it's going to be in that morning. Um, you can sign up for it on Town Square's website. And uh, the uh, Historical Society and Larry have been kind enough to join us in honor of the uh, city's anniversary and uh, point out historic sites along the way. So can you tell us about what we're gonna see on that walk? Well, one of, the th one of the nice things that you can see is there are three places on the National Register of Historic Places in Green Lake, and the walking tour includes all of them. And of course, you mentioned this building, and then there's the Thrasher Opera House and the Green Lake Village Hall. And so all of those are listed on the state and national registers. Um, Another exciting thing to be able to do is um, this community is very fortunate to have a wide variety of architectural styles in its housing in very close proximity to each other that most of the time in small communities here you don't see where the housing looks very similar. And so there's some Italianate houses, some Queen Anne houses, uh, some stucco um, bungalows, um, just a whole variety of kind of houses that you'll be able to see. And sometimes when we do these walks or whatever, and then, you know, we're kind of watching the road, but we're not necessarily looking at what's along the edge. And so that'll be kind of fun to see, see those as well. Um, one of the oldest buildings in town is on, on the walk. It's been a repurposed building just like this, and that would have been the original Methodist church. And wh where is that? I, that I'm is not... on Hill Street, just about a half a block to the west from here on the opposite side of the street. You need to get out more. And it's currently a beauty salon. Oh, that's the beauty salon. That was the Methodist Church? That was the Methodist Church. Wow. So. That is really cool. Can you tell us uh, some crazy stories about what... Uh, well, maybe they don't have to be crazy, but that would be good uh, if they were, <laughs> about things that uh, have gone on in this building and not the one about the B-A-T. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, this is the part of the building that I didn't have to come to very often. We were, I worked for University Extension, and so we were in the basement, and we considered ourselves the foundation of the county. <laughs> yeah, well... And thanks for that. <laughs> um, you know, part of my job was to help people understand, know what was going on, just sort of like this program is doing, helping people know what's happening at this wonderful community center. And we had to do radio programs, which were pre-recorded. And in the basement, if you venture down there, I think they're still there, there are some vaults. And we had to go in the vault every week and tape record our radio shows. And um, what, what, year, what year was this about? I, I, um, I was hired here in 1973. Okay. And so your, your radio shows, you had to go into the vault We went to into do it? the vault and we had a tape recorder and we taped the shows and then we'd mail the tape off to the radio station <laughs> and they played them at some real reasonable hour, like about 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. So there might have been one or two people that were listening. Although I did have somebody meet me on the street one day and said, oh, I know you. I hear you on the radio. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> So this, this building is full of vaults. When we got in here, we were like, what is the story with all of the vaults? And all I could ever figure was that when the building was made, it wasn't where you didn't have copy machines, there were no computers, and so yeah, original documents were, that was all there was. Is that, is that actually that, the reason? That's pretty true. What, and what happened is in, in most early, the beginnings of communities, the buildings were frame or log, and their fire, their heating systems were usually wood fires with chimneys that sometimes failed, and then the buildings would burn. And so many early records from communities were destroyed because the 
the buildings um, had burned. Mm -hmm. And so once a community got to be prosperous, they would build a brick structure and the courthouses and other important buildings would have vaults to store all of those records in. So if there was a fire, if you happen to see the vaults here, you will notice that they're, they're pretty substantial. The bricks in those are actually part of the material that was from the previous courthouse that was at this site. There was a previous courthouse at this site? Yeah, the, the, the first... I thought we were first in. The first, the, first, the first county courthouse was on this site that started in the 1860s. And was that a, a, a frame building? It was partially framed. There was some brick to it, but mm -hmm. it was, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So they, when the, and the, the building was actually kind of out to the east side of this building, and so they were able to use that material and start building this building. But the other building kind of collapsed during... Uh, a rather major trial, and the second floor kind of gave way. And, what? Uh, well, it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't collapse at the time, but it weakened the structure, and so they decided they needed a new courthouse. This floor that we're on? Well, not in this building, in the building that was here before. It, it, during yeah. a major trial? Yes. Because there were, like, too many people in the That's room? That's right. What was the trial? Do you know? I, 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 I really, I'd have to go back and look. Well, I'm we gotta sure. get one but of those again. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty exciting. So I know, yeah. That's Criminals a, just aren't what they used to yeah. be. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of kind of an interesting building too, because each, yeah, you know, the building was. This building is kind of unique. It was the architect was was quite famous, William Waters. He he built. Um, designed a lot of public buildings in Wisconsin. Um, and this was the second building he designed for Green Lake. The first one was the Green Lake School. And so he was the architect of that as well. Um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, he was big time, right? Didn't yeah, he do he, the Wisconsin he, building? For he the did the Wisconsin building at the World's Fair. Yeah, yeah. In Chicago. Yeah, that's cool. So we're, we're in a piece of history right here. And this was the original courtroom, returned to its original glory just over the last couple of years by our generous donors. So, well, Larry, thanks for being here. We're looking forward to the walk. We're getting a map from, uh, we're working on a map with you where right. it'll show all these interesting places. So that's on and the All the people who want to go on the walk, in case they didn't learn enough from the handout for the walk, um, we're going to be having our depot museum open that day too, following the walk, so people can stop in and learn a little more about the history of Green Lake. Oh, cool! And you'll be there when, when we're starting the walk. Yeah, and I'll I be understand. there when we're starting the walk. Right. And then you just reminded me that you know this building's on the National Register, and you have an event coming up too. I think where you're going to be marking this building with a National Register plaque as well. We are. We are on uh, June fifth. Uh, the, there's a celebration uh, down in the. Uh, park uh, next to the lake for the 175th anniversary and at the start of that uh, at 10:30 in the morning we're going to finally after all these years being uh, passing a, uh, installing the plaque that designates this on the National Register of Historic Places so it's at 10:30 in the morning on the uh, 5th of July and I hope you can come by and uh, join us. Our uh, mayor, Ray, will be here, and our uh, state representative, Alex Dahlman. And uh, we're hoping for a good crowd of people because it's, it's pretty exciting to uh, see an important building like this uh, get preserved. And it's such a beautiful place. So, well, thanks for being here, well, Larry. Th thanks for inviting me. It's Larry Balin, and this is the Green Lake Show. Okay, our uh, next and final guest is going to calm us down from all of this excitement, uh, Carol Skivington of Free Spirit Yoga. Welcome, Carol. Hi, Carol. Thanks for being here. So, Carol is our resident, yo are you a yogi? What do you have to do to be a yogi? Well, I took yoga teacher training, and I do a lot of yoga and stuff like that. So you just have to do yoga to be a yogi? Yeah, I think so. Because I know and, when... And anyone that can breathe can do yoga. 
I thought you had to be like, you know, spend a certain amount of time on like a mountaintop in Tibet yeah. or something. I but think you're thinking it. of monks. Oh, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always get you two confused. Right? Uh, we look alike. So uh, Carol teaches uh, yoga classes here at Town Square. Tell us I when do. your classes are. So my classes currently are Tuesday evening at 6.15 and Thursday evening at 5. But I'm going to add a couple. This, oh. ju this just in. This just in. The, well, you've heard it here breaking, first. Breaking news. Um, I'm thinking about a chair yoga at 3.30 on Thursday. Oh. And, um, yeah, so a chair yoga, and then I'm going to have to um, bring back my Saturday morning at 9, I think, because there's a lot of people that come up in the summer and want right, to do some right, yoga. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Now, it's yeah. chair yoga. I've always heard of chair yoga for people who have uh, some mobility issues. Correct. Is that what's so, yeah, so that's for people who have trouble, you know, coming down onto the floor and then get back, getting back up. Okay. So it's a nice option if you, you know, you can still get good exercise. So if, you're, if you take yoga, yeah. are you more likely to be able to get off the floor <laughs> without using your hands? I keep hearing these things without where here's a, here's a test where, you know, you're going to be dead in 10 minutes if you can't get off the floor without using your hands. So if you're, okay. if you're getting flexible from yoga, yeah. will yeah. it help you, you know, not be dead in 10 minutes? I'm not familiar with this. Um, <laughs> no. This, this wasn't on the pre. It was on the internet. I want to see, Fran. Can you it's, do the flexible thing again, where you're like being flexible? That's <laughs> like the noodle. Thank you. I just Thank needed you. to see it. Okay. Yeah. No, you don't know about. Well, I read I, it on I the don't. internet, so I'll, you know it's true. I'll look into it. I'll do some research. Yeah, but look I do into have that, an exercise. Get back to me. I will. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to you. I do have an exercise. I would like to have a little audience participation. Would oh. people be up for that? Okay. And then we'll talk yeah. some more, and then we'll do yeah. some poses. I'm sort of taking over. Is that okay? <laughs> have at it, girl. Okay. All right. So what I want you guys to do is sit up straight, lengthen the spine, take your right hand and place it on top of your head, close down the eyes. I want you to inhale through the nose, and as you exhale, hum. So let's inhale. We're going to do it one more time. Inhale. Exhale louder. That's crazy. <laughs> now, why do you say that? Because it sounded like everybody was on the same pitch. <laughs> breaking the mood here. So <laughs> that's 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 her that's her specialty. <laughs> that is not it, Jennifer. No, so that's okay. Gosh, that's okay. It's a spontaneous it's like a talk show. It's a big moment for me. I very cool. Um so what I was gonna say was how did you feel after doing the inhale and the hum? Anybody? Calm. Good. Calm. Anybody else? How about you guys? Did, I heard you guys doing it. How did you feel? Did you feel calmer? And like, yeah. it's, it's a very relaxing exercise. And so that's the feeling that we're looking for after we do yoga. We do like a warm up and some breathing exercises and some asana, which is poses, and a cool down, and then a nice long savasana, which is rest. So yoga is really about mind, body, and spirit. So does, does it last, you know? I think that, oh, okay, I feel really calm after this class, yeah. but I took it on Tuesday, right. and now it's Wednesday, and I'm all screwed up again. Yeah, well, to your point of being a true yogi, like a true yogi really probably should do yoga every day, you know, for 10 minutes or something. You don't have to do an hour-long, you know, um, vinyasa class, but you could just get up and do yoga every day. So is that what you do with your students, is encourage them to just do I it do. every day and keep it up during the week yes, be I do. between classes? Yes. There's this absolutely fantastic resource. It's called YouTube. Have you heard of it? 
So on YouTube, you can find anything from a 10-minute yoga, a 20-minute yoga, yoga for bad back, yoga for knees, yoga for hips, yoga for anything. And But yoga really changed my life. So. Isn't it kind of cooler to go in person, though, when you're, well, like, yeah. have you doing, you know, with everybody, you know? It's very much cooler, and, and I can tell yeah. you my story if, if you want to know. Absolutely. It. Tell, us, tell right. us how you got into this whole thing. I will. I'll tell you the journey. So my first yoga class, I was thinking about this. It was either at the Y, like randomly in Waukesha, but it might have been with Nancy Vanderveld over here at the mm -hmm. gym uh, mm -hmm. across the street. And um, I really liked it, but I kind of went more for exercise, right? Just to stay in shape. You know, it was back in the day, jazzercise and all that. And, um, and then she had her studio on South Street, and then I really got into it, and I was doing it regularly, and I was really feeling the benefits of yoga in terms of, like, calming down and finding my center and liking myself because you know what it really is about that because you know for me I had a lot of negative self-talk from just you know stuff we all have stuff right and yoga really helped me to know that I am worthy that I am valuable I you're cool I could have saved you so much time <laughs> I would have told you that it's like Julia Roberts legs on pretty women she had 10,000 uh, he, he paid ten thousand dollars to to um to find out that he was worthy. Never mind. Anyway, so, and she, they were in the tub. No one knows this scene. Raise your hand. If, oh my gosh. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, but anyway, so, um, so I went to Nancy's studio on South Street, and then we moved to Mexico. And I really tried to keep it up in Mexico. We lived in Mexico just for a year, but it like totally interrupted my yoga journey because I uh, just, I couldn't get to it. I tried, but my kids were little, you know, managing a foreign culture and country and language. And so I just kind of dropped off the yoga map. And then we moved to Texas, like years later, I'm just leaving some years out for expediency. And we moved to Texas and um, I walked into this just incredible, adorable little yoga studio. And I mean, the energy was amazing. So um, if you can feel energy, you know what I'm talking about, but the energy was just very calming, very accepting, and really loving. So I started going to that little yoga studio. It's called Wild Spirit Yoga, and um, it just it changed my life. So anyway, one day I went into Wild Spirit Yoga, and there was a little thing on the wall, and it said um, a retreat in Marfa, uh, which is in West Texas. Raise your hand if you know Marfa. Yes. So there was a movie with Elizabeth Taylor and... Who's the guy? Anyway, it was filmed in Marfa. Um, it's a really giant. Famous. Yes, giant. See, I I do know oh something. It was filmed in Marfa, and while we were there at the retreat, guess who was there making a movie? Elizabeth Taylor. No, she was dead. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but um, what is her name? Annie Hall. Why can't I think of her name? Annie Hall. What's her name? Diane Keaton Diane was there Keaton. making a movie. So I have pictures of her. Well, what does she have to do with Giant? Well, nothing. But you got to take yoga. <laughs> this is all screwed up. No, this is just all over the map. So anyway, I saw this sign, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to this retreat. And it's a 10-hour drive. I lived in a tiny town called Tomball, Texas. Anybody hear, hear of Tomball? Tomball, Texas. So we took a 10-hour van to Marfa out in the desert in West Texas, really cool place. And by the time we got there, we were all friends. It was really amazing. And then we spent uh, four days there. And I don't smoke or drink or smoke pot, but there was like a lot of pot and drinking going on. I'm just sorry, boys, shut your ears. But um, that's kind of an aside. But anyway, <laughs> but my, I had a wonderful roommate who was not like that, which was great. But the yoga and stuff was really amazing, and I'm sorry, is that too much information? Okay. Absolutely not. <laughs> Thank you. Um, You're just getting to the good part. <laughs> I know. But it really, in all seriousness, it really did um, change my life. And, um, you know, I just came home thinking, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, and I'm a good person. And Is there, like, this, like, spiritual aspect to yes. it all? Yeah. Yeah. There is. Do you think that you're like a spiritual first, so you're attracted to that? Or you go into it and you, you know, well, get the spirit or yeah, whatever that's it is? That's a good question. I think that everyone agree that our, our um, culture is very fast-paced, like go, 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 go. And, um, you know, 
while activity is important, like I have another job, which is a very active job, and I have to be very active and make deadlines and all that kind of stuff, um, it's also very important to be still and to do nothing and to honor, you know, your... I get a little emotional about it because it really did change my life. So anyway, but yeah, so it, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> sort of. Okay. I, I, guess, I guess I just have to come to the class and see for myself. Well, I mean, there are certain things. So we did the calming exercise. Um, I have been, you know, anxious about things, whether it's family or, you know, work-related stuff, driving the car, and I will do yogic breathing, and it just calms me down, or I'll do what's called mantra. So there are different mantras that, you know, I mean, I could say them, but they're not in English, um, and I'll say the mantras in my head, and that also just gets my mind from, like, um, being in a lock of anxiety and stress and things like that. So it's just a really great tool. Well, will you send us off today with a couple of uh, yes, ideas here? Yes, I will. Okay. okay. So All right. Would you like to read these and then? Okay. okay. I'm going to so read do... them while you're doing them. Is that yeah. how this works? Yeah. And anybody, if you guys want to stand up, I picked two really easy ones. So uh, if you want to stand up and do them, we can do that. I'm going to grab my mat. Okay, I, I, I will remain seated because I can't read standing up. It's my age. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Stand with a tall, elongated spine. Okay. Roll shoulders down and away from the ears. I, I, would pick them up first. I wonder if the chickens are listening. Uh, feet are about hip width apart, in steps parallel. Okay? Yep. Engage the in abdominal muscles. This is not the fun part. Uh, gaze at a focal point in front of you. This is called a drishti, a non-moving focal point. Find a non-moving focal point. Focus on the breath. Hands are on hips or in namaste. Do you like that? Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, prayer position in front of the chest. Bear the weight of your body on your left leg by tightening the thigh muscle and lifting the kneecap. Oh, yeah. So you're just you're engaging this muscle and pulling at the kneecap. Okay. Place the sole of the right foot against the left ankle or calf. Are you doing tree? Oh, <laughs> I thought we were doing a different one. So, oh. okay, go ahead. I guess I'm in the tree. Like the birds. Yeah. Uh, bring the sole of the foot up to the inner thigh of the standing leg. So for a tree, you can do like a little kickstand, or you can do your calf, or you can do your thigh. You're going to do your knee because you're actually pushing your foot into your leg. So you don't want to push your foot into your knee. But you can pick it up. Okay, we're trying not to kill anyone here. So find your balance. Balancing poses are good for concentration. They're good for your brain. So we're balancing here. If your foot slips, hold the ankle with one hand. Knee points out to the side, aligned with the hip. Ooh. I always find a drishti on the ceiling. Roll the shoulders back. Bring the arms up. Open your heart. Should I keep reading? You're already there, right? Raise the arms above your head. If you have high blood pressure, keep hands on hips. If you are holding the ankle, rest the palm of your other hand at the heart center. Hold eight to 10 breaths. Okay. Thank you. If you want to say wow. the benefits of the pose are at the bottom of the card. Okay, the benefits are this improves balance and posture, strengthens hip and thigh bones, legs, ankles, and feet, opens the hips. Bonus promotes centering. Yay! Who doesn't need centering? Oh, I think that's Yeah. Centering means like being balanced and doing all kinds of things. Like being centered. Like not having like crazy thoughts. Right? Are you going to do a torso twist for us? Sure, sure. Okay. Get ready for the torso twist. 
Twist to get, no, never mind. Uh, okay, stand with feet about hip width apart. Spine is tall and elongated. Roll shoulders down and away from the ears. Hang, arms hang at your sides. Turn your upper body from one side to the other with arms swinging slowly as if they were empty coat sleeves. Head moves in the direction of your upper body. Allow the right heel to lift as your body turns to the left. Left heel lifts as your body turns to the right. Thank you. Repeat this <laughs> loose side-to-side -side motion as long as you like. All right. Yay! Yay! Shall I, tell, shall I tell them what they just did? You just loosened your spine, upper body, arms, and hips. It counteracts too much sitting. Guess I should have done it. Uh, improves circulation. Increases energy. Sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, it's a really good thing to do in the morning when you get up if you feel sick and you get up and get out of bed. It's just really gentle. It's just a nice spinal, so it's a nice way to wake up your spine before you like jump into your day. But this is a really good one if, you're, if your lower back hurts and you're, so you can just take your feet about this foot distance and just hang. Oh, yeah. It's called ragdoll. It's called ragdoll. It bend your knees generously. If you we'll be doing that. That's all the matter right there. Okay. Sorry, oh my God. I'll just be doing that from a seated position. <laughs> oh! Chair yoga. Chair yoga. Exactly. Heal us, woman. <laughs> it's called Breath of Joy, and you can do it um, to really have energy in the middle of the day instead of getting a cup of coffee or coke or something. So you take your feet like hip width distance, and then it's going to be a three part inhale through the nose like this. And one long exhale. And it, really, it sounds silly, but we're all in this room together, and it really helps to let go of tension. There are arm movements that go with it. I'm going to show you first. Again, when we can get you in person doing that with us, so Your the class yoga times. Sure, Tuesday yeah. six fifteen, here in Studio A, um, p.m. of course. Um, Thursday five o'clock p.m. downstairs in Studio A, and then um, I'm going to add a Saturday morning, probably at nine. Okay. In a couple of weeks, and hopefully chair yoga three thirty on Thursday. So please spread the word because it's really we have a lot of fun. We have a great group. <laughs> And our next uh, Green Lake show is going to be in uh, July. The date escapes me because we have many dates. But watch our website and watch our Facebook page. Ninth, July 9th. So guests are uh, yet a mystery. We still have uh, to be determined. To be determined. We have we have several people who we're talking to, but uh, tonight was awfully fun. I thought so. It was uh, fun. Yeah. Let's land the plane and get these folks out of yeah. here. Woo! Thank you so much for coming to the Green Lake Show. And thank you, Fran. Thank you, John. And a big thanks to Ted. And also to Phil. Late living is a life for me. And spreading out so far.